Live. Okay, great. So hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us. I'm particularly excited today to be with uh, Howard Lorber, the uh, chairman of Douglas Elliman, uh, and joining us all the way from London, Stacey Watson, who's our international partner with Knight Frank. So hey, guys, thank you so much for joining me. Our pleasure. Thanks for inviting us. Thank you very much. It's great to be here. Great to see you both. How are you both doing? Not bad. We're doing yeah. fine. Uh, it's a nice day up in uh, northern Westchester and uh, got a little sun today, did a little walking and made a lot of phone calls like usual. That's, uh, we call this, you know what we call this now, business unusual. Yes, exactly. Business unusual and it's like Groundhog Day. Exactly. At least Howard, when it's sunny, when you wake up, you just don't want to roll over. So at least it's a sunny day. Yeah. <laughs> and Stacy? Yeah, I mean, it's even sunny in London, so I can't complain. Uh, we had highs of 80 degrees today. Um, and we're actually allowed to now go out and exercise and be outside as much as we like. And we're also allowed to meet up with um, one person from another household as long as we're outside and we're socially distancing. So I met a friend at lunch and went for a really nice walk around Regent's Park. So Great. can't enough. complain. So you're getting out there. I am getting out there. We can't do that yet, Stacey. No. Sorry, sorry to rub it in, sorry. <laughs> it's a taste of what's to come. Well, that's exactly, and I wanna to touch on that because that's, that's actually a perfect lead in. So today's going to be a global uh, market update. We do market updates all the time. This one's a little bit different, uh, different times, obviously. But I want to, you know, our cities are similar. And Stacy, maybe you'll also touch on not just on London, but more the international as well. But um, our cities are, you know, New York City's 8.5 million. I think London's closer to 9 million. And you were on strict quarantine for a shorter period of time than we were, but on strict, strict quarantine, right? Yeah, that's right. I mean, we actually didn't lock down officially until Monday, the 23rd of March, which I think was two weeks after you. Right. Um, and we sort of had our restrictions lifted to what I said earlier about being able to go out as much as we like and meet someone from another house. Um, that was lifted last Wednesday, the 13th of May. So at the moment, some people have returned to work where it's safe. Um, and where they're able to get to work safely. So um, we're still being asked to avoid public transport where possible. Um, but there have been many people that have returned to work and our construction sites and things like that are now back. Oh, okay. fully, yeah, fully working. Okay, all right. I wanna, I actually, I will come back to that. I wanna come back to that. Let's, I wanna start with some numbers. Um, New York City, so we just got April numbers and for new listings, in, these are for April, 200 new listings this April, as compared to last year, were 2,000. Um, that's New York City. Howard? Yeah, th th those numbers are meaningless because what we're telling our agents is don't bother putting up a new listing now mm -hmm. until we're ready to be able to show them. Why get people you know, looking at them, not looking at it by the, by the time Whoever, whenever we can get back to work, it's sort of stale already. As in, yeah. so we've been advising people: look, do what your customer wants. I think most customers do not want it because they just don't want to put it, have it put up yet. If they insist on putting it up, put it up. But your advice should be to the customer: let's wait until we're ready to go. And yeah. we'll, I think probably two weeks in advance when we're ready to go. So that's the time you can start putting it up. Yeah, so we've had, so we have three listings ready to go. We're holding them, as you said. But I'll tell you, the ones that we had on, that remained on, that we kept on, we are now starting to get calls. I've seen the last two, three weeks, this trickle, like it's pushing the market. People are really anxious to, to get this going. Thank God we're being safe, but that, that's what we're experiencing. I think there actually is some pent up demand, but what I think may happen is we'll have some pent up demand, we'll open, It'll be a few months and then and then the real issue is what happens after that right what okay. happens after that? that's the big question right and in the and fall. stacy in london 
Yeah, I mean, we've seen it was a similar situation for us here. And I think as the announcement got made, that uh, sort of interaction on social and the sort of digital platforms has actually gone back. The, the levels of inquiries through um, online and social has actually now outperformed where it was pre-lockdown. So everything's sort of righted itself. And actually at the moment um, on our database, um, the potential spend of people that we have registered just for London is actually 52 billion pounds. Wow. So that's the total potential spend of people on our KF database for London at the moment, which is actually 20% higher than this time last year. So I think that the minute that you have some clear guidance on your um, sort of route back, things will definitely start to come back. Um, we had 450,000 um, buyers and renters whose plans were put on hold from lockdown. So that's starting now to trickle through, albeit, you know, relatively slowly as we can sort of keep up with demand. I thought, I think the difference though also, Stacey, is the fact that you've just come from a couple of years of a pretty bad market. That's right, yeah. Lower prices. We mm -hmm. really didn't. It was a little softer, you know, and then it started coming back. Actually, before the virus this year in 20, it started looking better the first couple of months. Didn't you see that, Stephen? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Everyone thought this year, I mean, we were, everyone was off to a very strong start. Right. Yeah. And obviously, no one could see this coming. Sure. So that I'm going to, I'll throw out one more number along those lines with April. Basically, 20% of, um, or I'm sorry, uh, yeah, 20% of contracts signed as compared to last year, close to 200 contracts signed as compared to last year, April, there were a thousand. But I suppose we've gotten some contracts signed. For the most part, they were things that we were dealing with right before we went into this. Right. I, when, when, when we look at our business in general, I think most, most companies are, are, it's pure speculation at this point, but projecting sure. somewhere, this year that we would end at 40 to 50 percent of the business that we did in 2019. You know, I have to tell you that that actually surprised that's more optimistic. That's a, a stronger number than I would think. I think it is optimistic. Yeah. But I can only tell you, and I don't know how much April means, but April, we we were probably 50 percent of where we were last April. Okay. But now you have some very bad comps. Because May and June, and June especially, was the best month ever in the history of the business because everyone was trying to avoid the new mansion tax. That was right, there. yes, that, and everyone was getting everything closed. That's right, that's right, yeah, yeah, yeah. 20% of where you were last year. Right. But that's yeah. a fair comp. And what, so I want to touch on, because we're in this unusual business as unusual, as you say, what percentage... Or what have you heard about, and Stacy, for you as well, virtual showings, things that actually got done. I know that it could, it would be more maybe with new development, but yeah. sight unseen deals are getting done. I mean, we've seen in our rental market, actually, our city and east and the riverside part of our business here in London, they conducted 105 virtual showings um, the first week of May, which led to 21 offers. Um, and this is compared to 51 viewings, which led to seven offers the week before lockdown. Um, so I think, again, people are using all of the different applications available to them to make business happen. Um, and the same thing with our international business. You know, at the moment, travel is still restricted across um, our European markets. Um, and we have virtual viewings of chalets going on in the Alps with buyers in other locations. And they're all proving to be uh, very informative. And actually, it allows buyers to be able to go back more frequently to these properties overseas and sort of ask more questions and do a sort of deeper dive on things when perhaps they would have had a smaller window if they'd been visiting. So it's been interesting and we've, we, we are seeing transactions starting to happen this way now. Yeah, I, I've seen some, some transactions. They were relatively small transactions though, price-wise. Mm -hmm. uh, we have done some deals virtually, uh, you know, in the one to $3 million range. Okay, I a few. Um, I think that we did better on the virtuals with new projects because people aren't used generally to walking through, they go to a sales office. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. To a virtual of a sales office, because that's in itself a virtual of what the building's supposed to look like at the yeah. end. So it's a virtual of a virtual. 
you know, it's doesn't bother them that much. So I think it's funny, we came off of that where people were coming away from they're never buying off plan again. Exactly. Now right. they're quote, buying off plan again. So exactly. yeah. And, 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 and sometimes, you know, the building's just about done, but uh, now they're moving the sales office into the building and not finished yet. But we've done pretty well. We, we've done a few. We did an 11 or $12 million deal. Uh, we have a contract out, as I mentioned to you, should be signed, uh, we, we hope, uh, $26 million. Wow, uh, new, that's great. New luxury yeah. town high rise. So there are, there are some. There are some that are, that are happening. Uh, I think most likely resales are more difficult to do um, because I don't know how much people trust a virtual showing. You know, when you're in an apartment, you can look at every little thing. Right. Yeah. So, you know, if you're talking about a pre-war co-op, good chance it's going to look great on the virtual, but it's not going to look quite as great when you go to see it live. So, that's yeah. a so I'll, I'll share a story that the, Howard, you touched on this when we first went into all this. There was a, when you were on a call with all, all the CEOs of the different brokerage houses. And um, we were talking about that, you know, there's a camaraderie, we're all competitors, obviously, we're in business, but we're coming together. So I had, we have a deal that went into contract during this time, a broker who lives next door to my seller, it's a pied a terre for my seller, so they're not there. This broker who I know went in, she got the key from the doorman, obviously, got permission. She did a whole, she for me, she's not involved in any way, she's just a broker that happens to live next door, and did the whole face, you know, virtual showing for me, and we got a contract signed. And it's because of her, frankly, her graciousness and just, you know, being, everyone's just trying to help each other out. So. Yeah, I think that's true, and I know that's happening a lot in the Hampton also, because especially for people that want to rent their houses and they're not there, um, there's been some brokers that have, uh, not, not with us, of course, but there have been some brokers with other companies that have actually done it. And one of them, one of them got caught and I heard there was a $10,000 fine assessed. I and, and I would say you can make a business decision if it's a $10,000 fine, but if they could also take your license, that's a bad bet. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so there's so much you want to gamble. Sure that they don't, uh, don't go in. So let me just shift on that. Stacy. So. Are you, are you now, I know you're, you're dipping your toe in, but are you able to do showings for yeah, one? Or how does yeah, that work? So, um, so our corporate headquarters has not gone back at the moment. As you might imagine, there's a thousand people in, in that, much like 575 Madison Avenue. The, the process of getting people back into that building is uh, much sort of more technical and, um, you know, there's a lot more precautions to be put in place but um, in terms of our high street offices um, they are now back open as of Monday um, there is a rota of people that can be in the office so only sort of a, a very small amount of people skeleton staff um, social distancing obviously in place PPE available um, and you know they have to wipe everything down etc um, and then yes we are allowed to do showings but there's obviously more protocols in place so we have a checklist that we have to go through and then we have um, some letters that we send to the person that owns the property and then the potential buyer looking at the property um, of things that we would expect them to adhere to and how we'd expect the property to be sort of um, set up for a viewing so you know um, the, the protocols yeah exactly and maximum of two people um, viewing the property um, with the night frank people as well and then we would hope that the people that live in the property could vacate if they can't they need to be able to socially distance opening all the doors ahead of time you know removing shoes putting a face covering on wearing gloves um right. much as you would expect but just making sure that everyone signs into the protocols before we carry anything out i i would imagine that we'll start the same way i mean i can't imagine i'm sure there's not going to be any open houses for, for a long time no not uh, for some time that's just would be a disaster. So I think that our protocols will probably be very similar, whether they're mandated or not. I think they'll be similar because don't forget in the resales, you know, the owners just as concerned as the broker and the buyer. So everyone sort of has the same interest. So I think there will be that protocol. If the owner could leave better, less people involved, surely wear a mask, surely take your shoes off, uh, surely not, you know, don't, don't open doors, don't touch things when you're going through the apartment. 
And I think that's, you know, com that's pretty much common sense. As far as coming back to our own offices, I'm not so sure. You know, I've heard, you know, it, it always is when we have the most offices and the most office space, that's when things happen, right? That's just, uh, just one of those things. And so many brokers have said, oh, this working at home is not so bad. You know, before that, they all wanted, you know, big offices and so forth. And I think the other problem with going to offices is the whole setup in, in, uh, in New York changed over the last few years because the commercial real estate brokers were smart. If you were, if you needed more space, they were taking you to a new building and showing you if you set it up right, you don't need more space. And how did you set it up right? You had more open areas, less mm -hmm. private yeah. offices. But today that's just, and that's only been the last few years, three, four, five years. So today, a lot of our offices are like that. And guess what? No one's gonna wanna be out in, in an area where there's, ten, it's like the WeWork model, right? That's right, yeah, everyone wants their own. Yeah, 40, 50 people there, one spot. So now it's gonna be back to lots of, if you were designing an office today, lots of small private offices. So someone can come in, go right into the office, close the door, and you know, do what they want to do. Isn't it amazing? It's going to be a slow comeback, you know, because people have gotten used to dealing with working at home. When do you when do you predict? I'm predicting June fifteenth. Uh, I think something maybe will come out in the beginning of June, and then it's usually two weeks later. I'm hoping um, that it's June fifteenth, and I think it really it really should be, you know, at this particular time. It really should. And that's be. when we'll be able to come back to the office slowly, start showings. But then we have to deal with buildings and their own individual bylaws, and if they're allowing. It may be, it may be buildings, some of the co co uh, the older co-ops yeah. and so forth, where the boards are going to say no, no, and they have the right to say no. Sure, that's so right. Yeah. Deal with that. Um, obviously, new developments, they'll be thrilled for having people come back in, so forth, because they're trying to sell. And I think that, uh, you know, on the new development side, you know, we started doing it actually before this happened about talking about uh, when things were slow, the new development, talking about sort of uh, rent to own programs where we would rent some of the units, but we would really be very careful in who we rent to. We only wanted to rent to people that we thought could possibly be a buyer. Mm -hmm. Incentivize them to buy. Sure. The first year you give them a credit for, you know, all the rent they paid. Right. Like that. So um, those buildings will, will be accessed probably pretty easily, but I'm sure there will be some co-ops, probably less condos, that will decide to do that. Got it, thank you. So I want to, um, I want to talk about two different levels of the market. Um, we're, again, no one knows exactly, but I think with interest rates in, in in the US, in New York City, with interest rates so low and the possibility, uh, you know, the 2 million and, and below market, I think potentially could be very strong um, for new buyers, interest rate, depending what rents are, it may make sense to own rather than rent financially. Howard, what do you think? I, I, think, that, I think that is true. Um, but there are people that just don't want to make commitments. So they're not looking at how right. You know, it's, even if it's the same price, they just may want to rent, um, you know, because they're thinking of doing, some, doing something different. Look, I, I, um, there are a lot of people who probably are going to speed up their plans. If they were thinking of moving to a different place, Florida, the suburbs, whatever, mm -hmm. this probably speeded it up. So you'll have an exodus of people, but you'll also have new people coming in. and. Um, I think that when we look at our other markets, we know, we know where they're going. In fact, uh, one of the uh, papers had a sort of a graph chart where people are going. And they knew that because of uh, the post office where people were putting forwarding addresses for mail. Oh, right, yeah. At the time. And where were they going? They were going to Florida. They were going to the West Coast. They were going upstate New York, uh, the counties upstate. Um, they were going to the Hamptons even. <laughs> Uh, you know, the Jersey Shore. So they were going to resort, you know, type of places. And so I think that, you know, that will continue. But that doesn't mean they're not coming back. And it doesn't mean that other people, you know, won't be, won't be buyers in New York City. And the fact is, a lot of people have jobs in New York City. And if you have uh, a, a, a husband and wife, a couple, say, that both work in the city and have kids, it's, it's pretty much impossible 
to go to the suburbs and do anything else and try to keep your job. Right, yeah. Uh, plus, there's a matter of if you need to sell and get a, a certain number and you're not necessarily getting that number and you can't say it, that might make the decision. That are going to leave now with the people that were planning on it and maybe just push them a little quicker and they right. weren't quite ready to do it. But, but they're thinking about it more now. So you're not, you're, I, there will be some that leave, but not a huge mass. You're not overly concerned. I mean, yeah, it's a lot. It's a lot when you look at tax revenue to, to, the, to the city. Mm -hmm. it, it is a lot. It hurts there. I mean, I remember in New Jersey, there was one hedge fund guy that moved and they came out. It was, it was surprising. They came out and said that he had represented 10% of the tax revenue in the whole state. Oh, I never that. It's <laughs> pretty crazy. Yeah. If that's the case in New York City. Right. Sure. Um, but uh, it would take a lot more than one person for that to happen. But there will be, there will be some that move. But, that, but that's been a trend now for a number of years. It's been a trend for a number of years. That's right. Blame the uh, the virus for that. You know, you, you can blame other things. You know, like uh, a government that has, to some degree, ran amok and you know hasn't watched the budgets and you know probably more so in the city than the state. But um, that's going to have to change. You know, if they want people to stay, that's going to have to change also. They have to make it more attractive. Got it. And Stacy in London. Um, we haven't seen it so much or we haven't got evidence to substantiate it so much. I think a lot of people that live in London do have property outside in the suburbs anyway. Um, but we haven't got enough evidence to show it. I know that we, there was some stories about in Paris, them sort of going to Versailles. And um, obviously it was well documented in the press about what happened in Italy with people sort of fleeing from the cities in Northern Italy down to the country. And I think that they can sort of track, much like you were saying, the, the post system. I think they can see with people's mobile phones, like where they're, um, sort of located but I think the UK is a bit different I think people have always commuted in and out of London and certainly it doesn't feel like London's empty in any way and I know when our offices reopened our country offices and our London offices have both been as busy as each other with new uh, inquiries and viewings um, but I haven't, we haven't seen anything yet, but I know that that will be something probably that Liam and his team will be keeping an eye on and, and reporting on if they, if they find anything. If they see it, got it. Mm -hmm. Okay. So then I want to then switch the other side of the market, which is the luxury market. Stacey, you're always reporting and giving us the wealth report update mm -hmm. from here. Uh, tell me, you know, some of you, what you, you predict, what you're experiencing. I mean, um, well, we've got a couple of things. Obviously, you've mentioned the low interest rates. Um, we've also lost, you know, the, the pound has weakened again against the dollar. 4%, I think, in May already. Um, and this is now, you know, people are looking to weak Brexit plans and things like that. So potentially um, for overseas buyers, the, the pound may look very attractive. Um, Knight Frank is a business. We uh, revised down the price forecasts. Um, we took it down to 7% for the UK and down by 5% in prime London. But much of that um, sort of restabilization has happened already. Um, I was talking to someone in our Notting Hill office today and he's actually, they're closing on a deal just over um, 20 million pounds and the currency gain for the buyer who was coming in from overseas was so great that actually he did full asking um, because the, the, the gain was so significant. So I think that a lot of our price correction has happened already and as far as sort of the, the rest of the market, we've got very low build rates and our inventory levels are sort of low. So I think with low supply and a low interest rate, um, I think as soon as our borders are open, we are going to be attractive for overseas buyers. Um, but that said, you know, we need domestic demand to lead over the overseas demand, especially at the moment. Um, but it's hard to tell because I think the back, the backup and the sort of suspension of the market, um, as that starts trickling through, it probably will show a spike. 
but then that might not really be indicative of what's to come because obviously it will level out again. So I think the next few weeks will be very interesting as we sort of see the numbers probably level out a bit more. Mm, interesting. Howard? Yeah, I think, I think you know, uh, we've seen some luxury buyers around. You know, the foreign buyers, to us the foreign buyers, a lot of them ha have been out of the market. Um, you know, the Asians have been pretty much out of the market because of controls and the same problems that happened to the Russians years before that. Uh, the South Americans who were always good buyers in the States and Mexicans, um, that was killed by the fact of the currency exchange. The dollar was too strong, right? too expensive, you know, for them to, for them to buy here. Um, so, so there's not, there, there's still some of that around and there always will be, but not as much as there used to be. And, and, and the big buyers today of luxury have really been the financial, the financial guys, you know, who've made a lot of money, whether they're hedge funders or bankers, you know, whatever. Um, they, they made a ton of money and they, they were big buyers and they came from other parts, uh, you know, uh, other parts of the country also yeah. to New York. Yeah. So I, I think that, I think that will continue, um, assuming the, the economy does what we're hoping it'll do. And I think it will because um, I was watching Mnuchin on the television, Fed is Secretary of Treasury. Look, it, it's very clear. They are going, and Powell, the Fed chairman, said it also, they are going to pump in as much money as needed. And, you know, you thank God for one thing. This, this whole pandemic was terrible. The only little saving grace was the fact that it happened at a time of very low interest rates. Because if we had to borrow all that money, the trillion, right. at high interest rates, then it would really be a problem. Yeah. But it's almost, it's almost no interest rates. And you know what could also happen is that, like, like a lot of Europe has negative interest rates. I don't know, uh, Stacey, have you seen negative interest rates in the UK at all? Not in the UK yet, but they, there is talk that across Europe we could start seeing that for sure. I saw it, I think, on the 10-year treasury here for about a day or two days when it was, you know, less than zero as a minus. Mm -hmm. So if, if we borrow, keep borrowing, and the rates turn to be negative because we're pumping so much money mm -hmm. um, into the economy and the economy gets good and people and the other economies don't get as good and people want to keep their money there... Well, if you think about it, it's somewhat ridiculous theory, but it's not quite pre preposterous because if they go to negative interest rates and you keep borrowing, you could actually pay back what you borrowed with the people's own money that they gave you because they're paying you to do it. So, <laughs> and I'm not, I'm not, I'm not saying that's going to happen, but it has happened to a small degree in other, in other places and um, it could happen. Uh, but but I, I want to say this as it, rela as it relates to the economy. There's no question that there was a great economy before this happened. Mm -hmm. This is the only reason it happened. It wasn't like the financial crisis, which was a money center crisis. All the banks were in trouble, um, and the lenders were in trouble. That's not the case. Okay, the stocks may have gone down to some degree, but that's not the case. The financial institutions are pretty pretty strong balance sheet wise. And so I think that is with all the money going in, and there will be more, by the way, we have not seen the last money going in. Uh, there will be another bill uh, Pelosi put in for $3 billion, from what I've heard around, that we're probably going to be at $2.5 tri billion, trillion, I should have said. Brilliant. Yeah. It'll be another $2.5 trillion around the end of the summer, and then more to follow after that. Who knows how much more? But they're going to pump the money in. And the Fed is in line with it. The Treasury Secretary wants it. The administration wants it. And they're going to get the economy going again. And that's what they have to do. So if you had to, again, I'm asking for predictions. We won't hold you to it. But the next, what is the next? Three months look like year, five years. Three months, look. In three months, I think the key factor to have everyone feel better is having a vaccine. Mm -hmm. And as yesterday when we saw yesterday when the market was up 900 points yes the out of cambridge massachusetts moderna actually did their first trials with humans i think it was eight people and they all did very well and they produced the antibodies which is basically what the vaccine is for to give you the antibodies for it and so that was a very good test there are also nine other companies that are very close to having vaccines that they're going to start testing on humans and so i think that um uh, what everyone is hoping for, 
and wishing for, and I think it actually is possible, although it may sound not possible, is that one or two or three or five of these companies are gonna have good vaccines and we're gonna have them by October, okay, or November. And from what I've heard, the capacity to manufacture them is gonna be very strong where we could probably get manufactured, believe it or not, 100 million doses each month for three months. That would be 300 million doses, which covers everyone in the country, right? I think the population is three point. So that mean, you mean the company's working with, with the, together. everyone's working together to, yeah. Either the manufacturing it will not be the biggest problem. Um, making sure they work. Sure. The and yeah. we've had a very good sign yesterday. And by the way, like Moderna, after they announced it, the stock went up. So what did they do? They went and they did an equity offering. I think they raised a billion, a billion, $200 million after the announcement got it yeah the money will be there for them they'll and uh, they'll do it and, and they'll manufacture like crazy there's no question about it so uh if that happens then boy i think everything takes off i think real estate takes off the stock market takes off although it's been acting pretty good anyway last month but i think it'll be good news for everyone because it's now it, it's really more it's really more the the being frightened by it yes of course Most, yeah. i'm frightened by it i you know I remember talking to a doctor, I wasn't feeling well, and, and he said, uh, well, maybe it's stress. And I said, stress? I don't have any stress. He said, look, if you don't have stress, there's something wrong with you. <laughs> like everyone's, good. yeah. I thought about it, and I said, wow, that's really, that's really true. So maybe that's what it was. And, and it probably was true, because I was having terrible indigestion, pains, and everything, and it was, check that, everything, it was, it was nothing. So maybe it was from the stress. So people are under a lot of stress. And, you know, and, and then when you have schools closed, you know, and parents, you know, that uh, probably are working from home if they work, but still, that's a, that's a tough road, a real tough road. So as, as the person on, uh, of the three of us who have had a nine-year-old and a two-year-old, yes, my stress levels are way up, but. Uh, <laughs> you used to have a lot more hair before this started. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I had a full head of hair before, <laughs> two months ago. <laughs> yeah. So I think, you know, we, we open up, we have a vac. This is the ideal situation. Sure. Vaccines available starting in October when we need them. And a lot of people get vaccinated. Um, that's, that's ideal. It may not be that easy. It may be a little bit later. They may be slower on producing it. But as long as the, uh, the end is in sight, I think we're all going to be feeling better instead of just sitting here and saying, oh, wow. Yeah. What happened next flu season? You know, next virus season, what's going to happen? Yeah, just yeah, seeing a light at the end of the tunnel will that, that's do a tremendous amount. Um, so I want to, uh, I've, you know, usually take questions, but this was so terrific. But one question keeps coming up. So Howard, I'm going to, people are asking about pricing and the market. Yeah. And again, I know you can't. I even had a developer call me this morning and said he was hysterical. Yeah. One of our developers on a project. Hysterical <laughs> laughing or hysterical upset? Like, very upset. Okay. Watching CNBC. Yeah. Said on CNBC prices is going to be down thirty percent. And I said I don't know who said it. I'm you trying. Shaking her head no. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And I don't even know what thirty percent means because realistically, if we look at new development, mm -hmm. okay, the original pricing of the new stuff on the market, they've probably come down between ten and twenty percent already. Okay. Right. Yeah. Thirty percent means it's going to come down another ten percent or fifteen. I get it, okay? And it could be, at least till things get going a little bit more. <laughs> to come down another 30%, you know, I, I don't think it makes any sense. Okay. I would surely be a buyer of lots of stuff if it was down, in, if it was down another 30%, because that would mean it was down, let's say 50%. Not 50 total, right. It's less than the cost to build, by a lot, to build the project, finance it, sell it, to do everything. So I, 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 don't, uh, I don't see that happening. Okay. So who said it? Stacy, any last words on that? Um, I mean, we revisited our global forecasts and, you know, whilst we amended some, some of them like slightly down, as Howard said, you know, a lot of these markets had already price corrected mm -hmm. um, and with the low interest rates and um, the various um, sort of government incentives, obviously in Italy, you have the flat tax you've got the golden visa, things like that. I think that we, they will look at extending things like that rather than reducing the prices. Um, and I think, you know, 
a, a moderate cor correction in some markets, but I think most of them have happened. The, the, the sort of off a cliff stuff has happened already. already yeah, it happens. Yeah, yeah. Okay. All right. I think so. All right. Well, New York, for instance, yeah, they could roll back this mansion tax, which would attract. A lot That's of right. Yeah, products. That's a simple, a simple fix. This, they're in such underwater. What difference does it make? I don't think. By the way, I think the end result of the mansion tax is that they would a lot disappointed in the in the small amount that came in because what that did is it got certain people closed early to make sure they didn't have to pay That's it. Right. Yeah, that had it quieted down, and then lots of people left. Lots of people left the city so yep. they to pay the mansion tax. So what good is that? Then they lose more revenue. Now, listen, that I, I hope that's the case. That, that's actually a great idea. And that They should do that, and they should give back the uh, state and local tax uh, deductions. Get mm -hmm. rid of the salt. Right, the salt. Those two it. things, we, we, do a, we do a lot. We do a lot. Have you heard rumblings of that? You know, you know it's, it's funny. It, it, it's yes and no. I mean, the problem is it's sort of similar to uh, when the states are asking for a lot of money. And I think the answer from the administration was, we're happy to pay, or mm -hmm. we're not, I wouldn't say happy, we're, ha we're going to pay yeah. for costs related to the virus, okay? But we don't want to pay for all your costs for doing a terrible job running your city or state or whatever, mm -hmm. because that would be unfair to the states that have surpluses. So like Florida, Florida has like no debt, has surpluses. I mean, why should they have to pay for the, uh, what's happened in New York City? For the virus, yes. Everyone will get paid. All the states will get the money for the virus. But I think it's going to be a tough, it will be tough to pass a bill when you have senators and congressmen from different states where the two states that, can, that are probably in the worst shape financially or New York and California. And those are very big states and very important states. But that leaves 48 states that are not like that. So are they going to vote? Are their people going to vote for bills? They represent the, you know, the, the citizens of their state. Are they going to vote for bills that takes care of all that? All that's going to mean is that they're going to end up having to uh, cost them money. You know, it's going to cost everyone money. So... And I guess at the end of the day, it'll be a little bit of both anyway. You know, they'll get some extra money, you know, not always. Right. Yeah. They try to get their place in order is the key. All right. Well, I appreciate that. I appreciate both of you. I'm going to end with, on a personal note, so I'll ask you, <laughs> big, big deep, um, we've been in this, like you said, business unusual, crazy times. What have you learned about yourself business-wise, but more personally about yourself, because you've had time to reflect, you've been alone, good, bad, ugly. <laughs> I don't know if it's just me, but time seems to go so quickly. You know, every day, it might be Groundhog Day or, you know, the same sort of ritual every day, but it's, you know, I'll be on my computer and it's first thing in the morning and before I know it, it's already, you know, one o'clock and... right. I think the time has gone really quickly. I think it's, um, I think it, it, it's strange how doing less makes the time or sort of being more stationary can sort of make time go quicker. I, I find, I've found that very strange. Um, but I think from a personal level, I have, you know, it's been very interesting to have this time to sort of, um, I would say get my own house in order, not just my work house, but actually my personal house. Right. So it's been very therapeutic in a way to have time to do things that you would put off for a long time. Taking I, care of yourself. Yeah. I'm shocked on how quick the day goes when, when you think you're not doing anything. I, isn't it so <laughs> true? <laughs> it's crazy. I get up early. I get up like 530. I watch TV, read papers and stuff. And then before you know it, it's uh, 12 or 1. And then before you know it, it's 5 or 6. Yeah. I, you know, and so I've had a lot of calls, you know, and some, some uh, Zoom meetings and things like that. But um, I, it, it is shocking. And, and I'm really, I think we're all happy about that because if we were sitting around and saying, oh my God, looking at the clock. <laughs> so it's mm -hmm. only been an hour, right. Really go crazy. Yeah. So I, it's been good. Um, look, the, the only, the, the real negative has been not being able to have any personal interaction other than this is the closest we get to personal interaction. Mm -hmm. Right. 
I could touch your face right now. I just touched you on this. <laughs> but mm-hmm. not having any personal, you, you know, I, I remember my my youngest son called me, I guess it was a month ago and said, yeah, I'm, I'm a little bored. I'm out in the Hampton. I think I'll take a ride up to Westchester to see you. And I said, no. And he was like, what do you mean? <laughs> and I explained it to him because, you know, he's like, I'm your son. I'm like, but Michael, it may not be safe. It may not be safe for you. It may not be safe for me. You know what? Mm-hmm. Whatever. And that, that's heartbreaking, you know? Uh, although I have learned uh, to do a lot more FaceTime with my granddaughter. She likes to FaceTime, so we do that. And you're doing, you do a lot of personal things and family things that you wouldn't have done before. Um, we had, we had, uh, had my first virtual Seder. Okay. Uh. So, uh, and, and it was very nice because you don't want to get mad at anyone, you know, and you couldn't, you couldn't complain about the food because whatever food there was, it was your own food. <laughs> I think we've learned a lot. And I don't think going to the office, it's, it's going to change. It's going to, it's going to change. I, look, I was the type of person that went to the office every day, wore a suit and tie every day. Right. For five days a week or some weeks, four days, if I was going to Florida for the weekend or something like that. And, and I don't think I'm going to, I don't think I'm going to be like that as much anymore. Uh, the other thing I learned is that for me, I can only not shave for five days. Cause if I try to shave on a six day, it's impossible to shave. Cause it's like too it's much. Too rough. And I, and I cut myself and stuff. So five days is it. So I shaved today for you and for everyone here. Thank you. And I told Howard earlier, I put it on a button down shirt for both of you. So there you go. It's much appreciated. Right. Guys, this was wonderful. Oh, entire, you know. What's that, nice. Howard? <laughs> I said, this may be my new office attire. Oh, got it. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm good with this. I'm loving it. All right. Both of you, thank you so much. Everyone, thank you for tuning in. Make sure you tune in this Friday, May 22nd, 2 o'clock. Tim will be with Dr. Sean Sadri of New York City, uh, which will be a very interesting conversation. So thanks again, everyone, and see you Friday. Thank Thank you. you.